Okay, shall we start? So we are talking about sparsity and the audience is becoming more and more sparse. <laughs> Hopefully it is not too technical. But anyway, today will be a little bit technical. Uh, but if you, if you survive, I, I think you will see more or less 30 years of uh, many works in image processing uh, summarized in, uh, in four hours of lecture within a single framework. Hopefully this experiment uh, is successful. So we'll just remind you where we uh, stopped last time. So we, we started discussing um, image priors. So our point of departure was to build a simple prior for patches because a patch is a small, uh, is a small region of an image. We said that building a prior for an entire image is, is a complicated task. Let's do it for a small region. It's a, it's, a, it's a more doable task. So then we selected some collection of exemplars or some code book, if you wish. And then basically we, we said that our model is vector quantization in this, in this code book. So a patch of an image is simply one of the one of the patches in in a given codebook with a uniformly distributed index, and of course this results in a very potentially very intricate and complicated um, prior on the patch. Then we extended this framework. We we said instead of doing vector quantization, let's just take any linear combination, not necessarily with unit coefficients and non not necessarily just one coefficient non-zero. But we'll, of course, we'll not take any unstructured linear combinations here because we will then be getting just just garbage. It will it, it is too, be, too big a subspace uh, to abandon any structure. And then we introduce structure by, by demanding this vector C of the representation coefficients to be sparse. And one way of defining sparsity, the way that, that we followed was uh, was relating it to super Gaussian distributions, and our prototype super Gaussian distribution was what is called the Laplacian or the double exponential distribution. That uh, is basically the, it's the biggest super Gaussian distribution whose log uh, density is still a convex function. Okay, and it gave us the L1 norm uh, prior in the in the map estimator. And then we saw that we can actually take this prior and extend it to the, to the entire image by demanding translation equivariance. So we synthesize our patch in uh, uh, using this combination of some, of some, some, local, um, some local functions, something that we call the frame, something that is bigger than a basis. And then we said that we want the same operation to synthesize all uh, patches in the image, and we ended up with this with this form of a translation equivariant uh, frame operator. Okay, so basically, essentially, we started with with a prior on the patch, and we obtained in a by a very simple extension uh, a prior for the entire image. So we don't need to deal anymore with doing processing on on a patch level and then combining the patches, or we don't need to uh, uh, to do anything more complicated than this. Okay, and of course, we also demanded here that at every point the representation coefficient is is sparse, and of course, this representation is redundant, so essentially, we are not looking for f anymore, we are looking for these c ns we are looking for this c, and there is an infinite number of ways that an image can be represented using the set of coefficients. We are looking for the sparsest representation, so we want to be faithful to the data to the measurements and sparsest and there is a trade-off between the data fitting term and the uh, and the and the prior term so we saw that when we introduce this prior so it can be it can be either this model or this model uh, we end up with uh, with an iterative algorithm that I explained to you with a little bit of hand waving that we call the iterated shrinkage or ISTA um, in which we we do a gradient step. Essentially, this can be can be viewed as a gradient step on the uh, L two squared objective, and then we do shrinkage, which accounts for the L one term. Okay, and shrinkage is uh, is the function that is depicted here. We call it also a soft threshold operation. So it shrinks 
the values of the vector of the input vector element wise to zero and when when they they are below this threshold mu or minus mu then we we simply zero them and in this way small elements of the vector are put to zero exactly and that's why this promotes sparsity okay and of course once we have the coefficients we can synthesize the the image back by by putting them into the synthesis operator okay so today i would like to show you more about this i would like to give you s s uh, a better theoretical foundation of why we are doing this okay so we did some hand waving i will show you um a chapter in numerical optimization, let's put it this way, that deals with what is called uh, proximity maps or proximal operators. And we'll see how, uh, how basically, by understanding what we are doing here, we will be able to generalize our priors to more complicated uh, settings. Okay? So th there will be some numerical part and there will be some modeling part. So if you, if you survive the numerical part, the modeling part will straightforwardly translate into iterative algorithms like this uh, that will, will allow us to do what is called pursuit in the literature. So we are trying to pursue a re representation of, of an image or of a signal in general in, uh, using, the, using this set of redundant coefficients. Okay? So let's start with... Uh, with this definition, we, we start with a convex function. I will be calling it H because F is reserved for our signal. So uh, our, our, our function is H. It is a scalar valued function. It can also receive values of infinity. So it, so it maps from RD to the extended real line. Okay. So we start with this function and we define what is called the proxi proximal operator or proximity operator or proximal map, proximity mapping. There are many names in different books. Uh, Basically, the proximal map is an operator that maps from Rd to Rd. So it takes a point in Rd and it gives us a point in Rd. And the way it is defined, it is defined as the minimizer over Y of this quadratic term plus H. So basically, I'm giving you a X and you find me uh, the mi minimizer of an aggregate of H plus something that doesn't allow you to be too distant from x. So it's a trade-off between minimizing h and remaining close to x. And this is, called, this is called the proximity map or the proximal operator. Now, why the heck this particular form? And, the, and this idea essentially generalizes the notion of an orthogonal projection. So imagine that our h has this form. In convex analysis, this is called an indicator function. So in convex analysis, indicator functions are constant or zero within a set and are infinite uh, outside this set. Okay? So, so basically, I'm, gi I'm given some convex set C and if the point X falls into the set, uh, uh, the set C, I will give you the value of zero. Otherwise, I will give you the value of infinity. Okay? So now, if you compute the proximity map, the proximal operator of this function, essentially it will be the minimization of the minimization of this proximity term plus the indicator function. Now the indicator function essentially restricts the arguments the, uh, among which we are doing the minimization to, to the set C because it is infinite outside. So basically we are essentially solving a constraint problem over C. So you are minimizing over all points Y in the set C your distance to the uh, uh, to your given point x, how is this operation called? It's called the projection, right? So you have this convex set C, and this is a point x, and you are looking for the closest point y in the set. Okay, so by, by returning this closest point y, you are projecting x onto the set. Okay, so if you have an indicator function, proximity map gives you exactly the orthogonal projection. If you have something else, it's a generalized notion of a projection. So you can project on a function, not necessarily on, on a set. Okay? So this is, this, is the, this is the mathematical reason behind, behind this operator. So let's see, we have seen proximal operators already. So let's see the proximal operator of, uh, let's first see a few one-dimensional cases, then construct uh, some sort of a calculus of proximal operators, see how we can transform our function and see how the operator transforms, and then uh, with these with these tools we'll we'll again see uh, see our ist algorithm, our iterated shrinkage, as a particular form of what is called proximal gradient, and then we'll extend 
the set of the set of priors that we are going to uh, to impose on our signal to something more complicated. This will result into more complicated proximal operators, but the algorithm <laughs> will remain the same. So we'll be we'll have a different proximal operator, but it will be uh, it will be the same algorithm. Okay. So let's start with this particular case of H. So it is a one-dimensional function from R to R. Okay. So H x equals lambda absolute value x. Okay, we, we have seen this already, right? The proximal operator is this one-dimensional minimization problem. We, we actually gave a, a closed form solution to this last week, right? And it was, it was the element-wise shrinkage operator that, sorry, that, we, uh, that we've seen last week, right? So it, it is a function, the soft thresholding function again, I will draw it again. This is the soft thresholding function with the parameter lambda. Okay, this is this is our function. Now we have seen also last week that if we add non-negativity constraints, so in the, I will define h to be a function like this. So it will be lambda x. There is no need to put absolute value anymore because x is non-negative. So it will be lambda x for positive x. It will be infinite for x smaller than zero. Okay, so this is our this is our h. So we are not allowing negative solutions. Okay, that's why it's infinite. So it's an it's like an indicator function of the of the non-negative or tant. In this case, it's just a semi-interval, semi-open, semi-open interval. Okay, so I I will again write this form of the of the uh, proximal operator. Of course, it turns into a constrained optimization problem for a non-negative y, and the function h just becomes lambda y here, okay? So now, uh, whenever I have a constraint problem, I will write the Lagrangian. So here I already wrote the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to y. So the mu is the Lagrangian multiplier, of course. Mu is the Lagrangian multiplier. Uh, so if the Lagrangian multiplier is, uh, of course, the Lagrangian multiplier is always greater or equal than zero in case of non-negativity constraints. So if y is strictly greater than zero, we say that the constraint is inactive, okay? And this means that the Lagrange multiplier is strictly zero, okay? So the constraint is inactive. And then if mu is zero, we say that y minus x plus, plus lambda uh, equals zero, which means that y equals x minus lambda, and when will this yield a non-negative y that we assume this will uh, yield a non-negative y uh, if x is greater than lambda. Okay, so for x greater than lambda, our solution, our minimizer is x minus lambda. Okay, so again, we are shrinking toward the zero. And if y is equal to zero, then mu, the, of course, this happens for x uh, smaller or uh, smaller or equal to lambda, okay, and of course in this case we'll get y equals to zero. So basically our sorry our solution here will be simply the maximum with zero of x minus lambda. In some books you will find this notation. So basically we are clipping at zero. We are saturating the function at zero, and we called it as plus. So it was a one-sided. Uh, soft thresholding operation, one-sided shrinkage, and in the in the machine in the deep learning literature this is called ReLU or rectifier. Okay. So again this is this is absolute value of x, lambda absolute value, and this is lambda x for x uh, for sorry for y greater or equal than zero. Okay, so this is this is the uh, these are the two possibilities. Okay, let's now see some properties of the multidimensional proximal uh, operator itself. Let's do a very simple transformation. Let's just scale all the coordinates uniformly by some alpha uh, distinct from zero. Okay, so I, I will define a new function g, uh, g of x, which is h of alpha times x. Okay, and again, I'm assuming that x is now in Rd. It's the d-dimensional case. Okay, so by definition, the proximal operator of G is, is, is this expression. I'm already substituting GY here in this form. Let's now do a transformation of coordinates. I will define Z to be alpha times Y. And of course, 
since y is our minimizer, it is 1 over alpha z, when I'm writing arg minimum over z, I need to scale it by 1 over alpha, because I'm looking for y, right, and not for z. So I'm scaling the arg minimum by 1 over alpha, uh, y becomes z over alpha, and alpha y becomes z. Okay? So then I can write, I can take this alpha outside the, outside the norm, and it will be z minus alpha x in the norm without a square, because the norm is squared, right? And here I will have alpha squared. Goes out with a square outside. Okay? And of course I can multiply everything by alpha squared, and this alpha squared will pop up here in the second term, right? So here we already see a form of approximal operator. So it will be 1 over alpha, this scaling here, and it will be the proximal operator of alpha squared h, because this, this is the function that is written here, and the argument is not x anymore, it is alpha x. Okay? So this is the rule for, for uniform scaling of coordinates. You can also extend it to any orthogonal transformation. So you, because you have an L2 norm, you can easily manipulate it with orthogonal transformations. Uh, you can also generalize it to some more extended, not necessarily orthonormal, uh, affine, I mean, not necessarily normal, but necessarily orthogonal uh, affine transformations, but there is no closed form expression, simple closed form expression for any general affine transformation. Okay, so only something that that can be easily manipulated within this, this L2 norm. Okay, so another case, important and interesting case, is the case of separable functions. Okay, so uh, let's assume that our function of x is actually a sum of coordinate-wise functions h1 until hd. Each of them is a one-dimensional function applied to each of the coordinates separately. So this is called a separable function. Sometimes separable function uh, is a function that we that is se that separates under multiplication, and here we want it to be separable under addition. Okay. So then we can write the proximal operator of h. Let's pay attention what is written here. This will separate into a sum, but this L2 norm also separates into, into a sum, right? So let's write it as a sum, okay? And let's actually write it as the sum over these expressions. So what, what is written inside is, uh, is a function. We are taking arg minimum over y. Essentially, y is 1, y1 until yd, right? And we, have, uh, the, we are looking for a minimizer of a separable, a separable objective, so we can write it as a vector of minimizers of each of the one-dimensional objectives like this, right? Now, each of these objectives, each of these minimization problems here, looks like a one-dimensional proximal operator, right? Of h1, and here it is of hd. So basically, we'll have just a tensor product of the one-dimensional uh, proximal operators of h1 until hd, evaluated at point x, okay? So, uh, so the proximal operator is also a separable function. Okay? Now, a particular case that we have seen of this already is the case of the L1 norm, right? So the, uh, the L1 norm is a separable function. It's a separable function, and therefore, the, uh, proximal, the proximal operator is simply element-wise application of, of the of the one-dimensional proximal operator, which was just the soft thresholding, in this case, with the threshold 1. Okay? So this is, this is our solution. It's a separable application of the proximal operator. Now, if you want to introduce scaling by lambda, let's just remember the rules of scaling. This is coordinate scaling, right? So I, I will write it in this form. I care about the proximal operator of lambda h, Right, h is the L1 norm in this case, and it will give me lambda here, 1 over lambda here, and 1 over lambda here, Okay, as we have seen before. So I can write it like this. Okay, Now, because of the homogeneity of the L1 norm, I can cancel these lambdas here. I'm assuming that lambda is non-negative. Okay. And then I can write it, of course, as the tensor product of these soft thresholding functions 
uh, with the threshold one. And then if I manipulate the scales in this soft threshold, there is a scale here and there is a scale here, I will just get this soft threshold link function with a new threshold lambda. Okay? And we have seen this already, right? So the, I'm, just, I'm just showing how our previous case falls into this category of proximal operators as a particular case. Okay? So this is the L1 norm. Now let's look at a different situation where we have a radial asymmetric function. So a radial asymmetric function is a function that doesn't depend on x but depends only on its Euclidean norm. Okay, so basically every, it, it will be an isotropic function. Every, in, it will look the same in every direction. Okay. So let's write it like this. I'm already putting the g term here. This is gx as a function of the norm only. Uh, sorry, g, this is not gx, this is gy. It's only a function of the norm of y. Okay. Let me open the norm into these three terms, right? So the norm will be uh, the norm of y squared uh, minus, so b because the one half is written here, so it, it will be, it will, the, the inner product of x and y will come with a coefficient two, and it will cancel the one half, and then there is a one half, the norm of x squared, okay? <laughs> and I'm writing h here as well, okay? So just change the order of, uh, of the terms here, okay? Now, let's convert this minimum into a, a minimum over, uh, I, I split minimization into, into, uh, sp into two functions. So I will write it as y that has the norm r, and then, I'm, and then another variable r, okay? So I have, I, I'm, I'm using two different colors. So y is a vector of given norm, so it, it lies on, on the d minus one dimensional sphere with radius r, r, and I'm optimizing for y, and then I'm optimizing for r. So arguably it's the same problem, right? So I'm writing minimum and not arg minimum because, well, it has a different parameterization. So then one, once I find the optimal y and r, I will, I will express y in this form. I will basically write it, uh, I will write the minimizer again. Okay, so let's solve this inner problem that I'm writing here in red. R is fixed, okay? It's only an optimization problem with respect to y, okay? Of a given norm. Well, you can use the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, right? It's, it's very easy. You have, find me a vector y of a given norm that minimizes the negative inner product with a, with a fixed vector x. What is the solution? It has, the, it has to be the same direction as x, and it will have the norm r. So I take x, normalize it by its Euclidean length, and multiply by r, okay? So this is my solution. Of course, r, r is constant. R, and I will now minimize over r in the second, in the second minimum, okay? So I, but I don't need the minimizer itself, I need the, the value of the minimum. So let's substitute this minimizer into the problem. The minimum itself, I can write it like this, right? I'm substituting this form, so it will be rx over x norm, inner product with x. Okay, so it will be r, inner product of x with x, it's, nor it's norm squared, over x, so this yields me r norm x, and this is the term I'm writing here. Okay, so I substituted this, this value here, okay? And this is the result, okay? Now, what remains is to minimize this expression over r, okay? So I just write it in a slightly more compact form, okay? So basically, you can see that uh, what is written here is essentially h r plus one half of r minus the norm of x squared, okay? So this already looks like a proximal operator, right? So basically what I have is this, right? So this is a one-dimensional proximal operator evaluated at which point? So it's a, a one-dimensional proximal operator of h, h is a one-dimensional function, evaluated at point norm x, okay? So this is, again, prox h at, at the point norm x, okay? Now I care about the proximal operator of g, 
which was given by, by this form. It was given by r x normalized by its length, right? This was our form of the minimizer. This was our form of y, right? This was our y. And I'm taking r from here, okay? So r will become the proximal operator of h. So this is my r, and this is what remains from the minimizer. Of, of course, it has to be a vector in rd, right? So essentially, I'm going to I'm going to shrink the norm of x and scale my vector by the ratio of this of the shrunken norm over the original norm. Okay, so I can I can see it as prox of h of x over x. This is my scaling factor of x. Okay, and now it depends on which x we decide to take. Right, so let's consider the particular case of the L2 norm. So the L2 norm, h will be, let's say, I'm, I want the proximal operator of lambda times the L2 norm. Okay? So lambda, the h in our case will be lambda times t for non-negative t's, and it will be infinite for t smaller than zero, because we do not allow any negative solutions, of course. Right? So just remember that it must be negative for those parts where we don't want solutions to, to pop up. So in this case, the proximal operator of h, we have seen it already, right? So it is this ReLU function. It is t minus lambda clipped at 0, OK? Or we called it s plus lambda t, OK? So what will be the proximal operator of lambda times the L2 norm? It's just a particular case of what we have seen, right? So this is our this is our h, this is our prox h. So we'll apply prox h at the point norm of x. Okay. Uh, of course. Well, it, it, it's fine. It will be the prox uh, proximal operator of h applied to the norm of x uh, times the unit vector x. Okay. So let's substitute the particular form of, uh, of our prox proximal operator. It will be norm x minus lambda clipped at 0 multiplied by the unit vector x. OK? And of course, I'm defining here that, that uh, basically that 0 over 0 is 0. And I can write it, so if I want to avoid this, this case, I can just write it in this form. So it's 1 minus lambda over the maximum of the, of the norm of x with lambda times x. So basically, this scaling that I have here, it looks like this. It's, of course, not negative. This is the norm of x. This is the scaling factor that, I, that I, I'm showing here. It will be obviously 0 for any uh, value of the norm that is smaller than lambda, and then it will grow asymptotically to 1. OK? This ratio. When the norm is very big, it will be a big number in the denominator. Lambda over this big number will tend to 0, and 1 minus this almost 0 will tend to 1. OK, so this is this is how this shrinkage works. So for any for any vector that has the norm smaller than lambda, I'm going to output zeros. And for vectors that have norm, norms bigger than, than lambda, I'm going to shrink the length of the vector and maintain the same direction. OK? So this is the proximal operator of the L2 norm. I'm not telling, uh, telling this to you just because, because of a general interest. We will actually use this for a specific type of a prior that I'm going to sh show you in a few minutes. Okay? Now, why do we care about proximal operators at all? Because of the following relation of uh, proximal operators with minimization. So I, I will assume that I have a convex function h, and I would like to minimize this function. So I would like to find a minimizer that I will be denoting by x star. I would like to, to solve a minimization problem, right? And basically, what we've been dealing with with all our estimation problem, we essentially wanted to f to solve some optimization problem, right? We had some uh, some uh, 
some uh, negative log likelihood term that we call the data fitting term, plus we had the prior. We wanted to solve minimization problems. And some priors gave, gave uh, uh, terms in this minimization problem that were not smooth. Okay, so you cannot just do gradient steps or any fancy uh, gradient steps that you that you that you want want to do, like I don't know, Newton or quasi Newton, uh, because the function is not differentiable; it has no gradient. Now, it appears that uh, the formalism of proximal operators allows you to solve non-smooth problems. It, it it gives you much more general. Uh, frameworks for doing numerical optimization. So what is the relation between this minimization problem and proximal operators? It appears that uh, that the minimizer of H is a fixed point of its proximal operator. Okay? So this relation is why we are interested in proximal operators. So we, proximal operators exist for non-differentiable functions. We want to solve optimization problems with non-differentiable uh, non functions like the L1 and some other more creative priors that we will see in the, in, in the sequel. And we don't have regular uh, smooth optimization tools for dealing with, with these problems. So we would like to switch to proximal operators, and this relation is crucial to, uh, to, to this step. Now, this statement is general. It can also be extended to non-convex functions. I will show it to you for sub-differentiable edge. And of course, you can also see how it works for differentiable functions. It is more general than that. It can work also for non-subdifferentiable H. Okay, so it's an if and only if statement. The proof is elementary, so let's let's see the proof. So let's see this direction. I have x that is the minimizer of the function H. Let's see that it is indeed the fixed point of the proximal operator of H. Okay, so if it is a, a, indeed the global minimizer of h, it means that for every other a, uh, for every other x, the value of h cannot be inferior, right? This this is what minimizer means. Now, if it is non-inferior, then adding something positive or something non-negative can only increase the value of the function, right? So I, I increased, I added something non-negative here. The, the, the inequality stays, right? Now, I can write this h at x star. This is the minimum value that the function can attain. I can write it in a funny way as h at x star plus 0, and this is my favorite way of writing 0. Okay? Now, why do I write 0 in this, uh, in this funny form? Because, well, this is just minimizing all this term with respect to x. Okay, so I'm minimizing h at x plus one half x minus x star. Obviously, the minimizer is x star, and the value is h x star, right? Because at x star, this this part is minimized, and this part is also minimized. It is exactly zero. Okay. Now, what does it mean? This is exactly the proximal operator, right, of h. So if x star is also, the arg minimum of this function, it means that it is the fixed point of pH, of the proximal operator of H. Okay, so this proves the, the right direction. So let's see the opposite direction. So in the opposite direction, we have, let's, let me start with a more general setting. So I'm, I'm evaluating the proximal operator of H at point Z, some point Z, and the result, let's call it some point Y. Okay? And the minimization is done with respect to x. Okay. Now, the, uh, this is this is a convex function because h is assumed to be convex. The the point y is an arg minimum if and only if, for a differentiable function, we would say that the gradient at point y is zero, and for a subdifferentiable function, we'll say that zero belongs to the subdifferential set of the function. Okay, so this is the subdifferential set of the function. It is the subdifferential set of h plus, of course, this uh, differentiable function contributes just one point to the subdifferential set. Okay, so it is again the subdifferential set of h plus y minus z, which is the gradient or the subdifferent, the trivial subdifferential of uh, of the of the quadratic term. Okay, now let's substitute y equals to z equals to x star, because this is what is given to us, that, that the proximal operator of 
x star is x star. So I'm substituting the argument z as x star, and it is given to us that y will also be x star, right? So the right-hand side is given to me. So I will substitute this expression, and what I will what I will get is that zero. So basically, this part of course will vanish, right? And it it will appear that zero belongs to the subdifferential set of H at point x star. Okay, and if this is true, this me this means that x star is also the arg minimum of H. Okay, so basically it proves the other direction. Now, now. Uh, how do we find a fixed point? Okay, so let me remove this. How do we find a fixed point? So we, we are so f basically we know that finding a minimizer of a function is uh, is like finding the fixed point of a proximal operator. So we replaced one problem with another problem. Now here we didn't have really numerical algorithms for doing for dealing with uh, with uh, non-smooth functions. Here we. If we know how to solve for a fixed point of a, of a proximal operator, well, we have seen proximal operators for non-smooth functions. Basically, all the examples we have seen were actually non-smooth, like the absolute value. So how do we find fixed points? Any ideas? Okay, so, so I want to, to, to find a fixed point of a d-dimensional uh, function, of a d-dimensional operator. Now, there is, a, there is a, probably one of the most important theorems of functional analysis that uh, that applies to operators to functions to maps that are contractions. Okay, what is a contraction? We have a map. We have a map from R D to R D. It takes points and it maps them to other points. So we can we can see how the distance. So here it will be the same distance. It's the L two distance. So we can we can take two points x and y. We will send them to P X and P Y. And we can measure what happened to the distances. So this is the distance in the domain. The domain and the and the range of this map is exactly the same, right? It's R D. But the the points x minus y or x and y were at some distance, norm x minus y. And then we can measure the distance between their images. This is the distance. And a map will be called a contraction if it is if there is some constant that is strictly smaller than one. That satisfies this inequality for every every x and y. So it means that it will always shrink the distances. Okay. So if, if a map that shrinks the distances is called a contraction. Now, for for any general C, this will be called a Lipschitz continuous or a uniformly continuous map. Okay. So this is the the notion of uniform continuity, and uh, and a contraction is something that has this what is called Lipschitz constant C strictly smaller than one. Okay. So it shrinks distances. It cannot preserve distances. It necessarily shrinks them. It, this the strictly smaller than one, one is important. Now, if we indeed have such such a function, such a map, then then there is a very important theorem that is called Banach's fixed point theorem that tells us very strong claims about about our map P. It tells us that there exists a unique fixed point. So it's, it, it, it exists and it is unique, and we can find it by simply applying p multiple times to any initial point. So essentially, we do what is called the fixed point iteration. Okay. So we start with some x zero, doesn't matter what it is. Let's say we start at zero. We apply p h to it multiple times. After a certain number of times, we don't move anymore. We converge to to the fixed point. Okay. So this is called the fixed point iteration. Now this is this is great, right? So we know how to find fixed points, but the problem is that the proximal operator is not a contraction. Okay, so just think of a projection. A projection is not a contraction. If, for example, if we project on a set, if our point is inside the set, it will remain there, right? So the distances will not be shrunk. It cannot it cannot expand distances, but it will not necessarily shrink distances. Okay. So it's not, it's not a contraction. It, it's a weaker property. It is it is a non-expanding map, and for non-expanding maps there is nothing. Okay. Now, uh, fortunately, proximal operators. Uh, of course, if H is strictly convex, meaning that this minimization problem has a unique minimizer, then this will be a contraction. Okay. But this is not generally the case. Now, fortunately, proximal operators satisfy a property that is called firm non-expanding maps. 
So this is this is the property. I will not show you the details. The proof is complicated, but basically there is kind of a very poor analog of Banach's theorem in this case. It is called krasnoselsky mann theorem. It tells that, first of all, there is no uniqueness and no existence guaranteed, but if there is a fixed point of P, then the fixed point iteration will bring us to it. Okay? So it's a much weaker property, but it still it tells us that we can do fixed point iterations to find to find fixed points of the proximal operator. There might be multiple fixed points, and we'll converge to one of them. Okay. What is what is true that for a convex function, any of these fixed points will give us the smallest possible value of the function. So it it might have that this problem has what is called a non-trivial minimizer set that it has multiple global minima. Okay, it has a continuum, a range of, uh, of global minima, but we will find one of them using the this fixed point on the on the proximal operator. Okay. Now this immediately translates into a convex minimization algorithm, right? So if you want to minimize a convex function h, just do a, a fixed point iteration with its proximal operator, right? This is called the proximal point algorithm. Very simple algorithm, and uh, it will only be efficient if the proximal operator has a simple form, ideally a closed form solution. So you don't want to do any iterative solution at every iteration to find the proximal operator. And in our case, for example, we had the, L, the L1 norm or some, uh, s some basically cases that we have seen where the proximal operator is simple. Okay, so if we have a simple proximal operator, this is a really this is really a good uh, way of solving uh, solving non-differentiable uh, minimization problems. Okay, so H I'm not, uh, H might not even belong to uh, to C one, can be non-smooth, it will still work. Okay, so just oppose this to some naive gradient descent or some fancy gradient descent with some some fancy scaling. It cannot deal with non-differentiable functions, but this algorithm can. And it actually converges well, converges fast. Now, unfortunately for many cases that even for the L2 plus L1 case, okay, or L2 squared plus L1 case, what we called Nuasso last week, there is no simple proximal operator in, in general case. Okay? However, we can still split the problem into, into the minimization of some smooth part, G, plus some, some other part that has a simple closed form proximal operator, as was the case in our Lasso problem. So the L2 squared part had a trivial linear gradient, right? And the L1 has a simple uh, proximal operator. So in this case, what we can do, what is called the proximal gradient algorithm. We can do, first of all, a gradient step on the smooth part of the objective, Okay, with some step size eta, and we can do something fancier than just gradient descent. It's it's just the, the simplistic version of this algorithm, and then we do a proximal step on H. And there are different interpretations in optimization, the optimization theory that can explain uh, why we are doing this and why this works. But at least you can, you you see the flavor, right? So you you are doing a gradient step, you're minimizing G, and then you are doing the proximal step, you're minimizing H. Okay, and together, together they converge and they, they apply to the more general settings where we, we don't have um, a, a simple expression for the proximal operator for the entire objective. Unfortunately, there is no simple calculus for the proximal operator of a sum of functions, and that's why we need these kind of algorithms. Okay, so basically our ISTA algorithm from this perspective is just a proximal gradient step that minimizes this L2 squared plus L1 with a fixed step, this fixed step eta that we had. Okay, so uh, we, I explained th this to you by hand waving that we selected some kind of a quadratic approximation of our function with fixed curvature, but this is a slightly more reasonable explanation, I hope. Uh, and there exist faster versions of Easter. Definitely doing gradient step with a fixed uh, with a fixed step is not necessarily the best thing you can do. There exist faster variants that vary the step and also use momentum, and they they actually provably achieve the best possible convergence rate that a first order uh, method can achieve. So this is typically known under the name of FISTA, and F stands for fast. Okay. Any questions? 
Okay, so w one, so in another another family of algorithms that I would that I would like to show you uh, uh, side by side with our proximal gradient is what is called the projected gradient descent algorithm. So imagine, that, so here we are just minimizing a sum of objectives g and h. It is an unconstrained problem. Imagine that now we are just minimizing g. g is smooth. I'm assuming that g is smooth. Is at least C2. Okay. And now I have here a constraint problem, x belonging to some set. A set can be expressed as a level set of a function, but suppose you you, you have this definition of, of a feasible set, of the set of constraints. Now, there is a family of projected gradient descent algorithms that do a very simple thing. At every iteration, you do a gradient step on G, and then you project your solution that might depart from the feasible set C, you project it back onto C. If you know how to project efficiently on C, this is a great algorithm. Okay, so for example, imagine that you would like to find a solution to, a, to G subject to non-negativity of X. So you know how to project onto the non-negative or tant, right, on R, R, D plus. So you just take all the values that are, uh, that are smaller than zero and you put them to zero. Okay, so this projection is very simple. And this is how you, you actually solve non-negative uh, non optimization problems, if the objective is smooth. So this is called projective, projective gradient descent. Now pay attention, the only difference between these two iterations is that here we have a projection and here we have a proximal operator. Okay, so remember that we, we that we justified proximal operator as a generalized form of projection. You can see this proximal gradient, uh, sorry, projected gradient algorithm as simply solving an unconstrained minimization uh, problem with the indicator function of your constraint set C. Okay, and and on the left uh, on the left side you have a more general function for which you evaluate the proximal operator. Okay, so you can think of proximal gradient as, as a generalization of the projected gradient descent algorithm. Okay? Any questions? Okay. Let's get back to our sparsity stuff. This, that, this was a very uh, this was a very brief introduction into non-smooth optimization methods because we need non-smooth optimization for uh, for minimizing anything that has L1 uh, L1 norms and we'll see more complicated norms. So our sparsity prior was based on the assumption of super ga super Gaussian distribution of the coefficients, with which we then use the synthesis operator to synthesize the patch or the entire image. Okay. Basically, this is this super Gaussian assumption. We use the, this double uh, double exponential distribution that gave us the L1 term in the map estimation problem, right? So you take negative log of this exponential, and you, get, you get the L1. Okay, and as the result, we have seen that we can solve this minimization problem. This is a non-smooth optimization problem using proximal gradient. And for the proximal operator for the red part, for the L1 norm, was just soft thresholding, element-wise. Okay? So you see, we start with a sparse prior. This sparse prior gives the L1 norm in the map estimation problem. And then we solve it using proximal gradient by plugging in the pro pro appropriate proximal operator into the proximal gradient iteration. Okay? So this was our flow so far. Now, there is another variant of sparsity that is also very commonly used. So basically, what is, what is the straightforward definition of sparsity? If I have a vector and I say that it is sparse, just count the number of, uh, the number of uh, entries that is distinct from zero. And basically, this number, the, basically, this is called the support set of a vector, the set of indices. This is support C. The set of indices on which, uh, on which the the elements of the vector are non-zero. It's like a support of a function, essentially. And the cardinality of this set is sometimes referred to as the L0 norm of the vector C. So if you take the LP norm to the power P, it will converge, as P goes to zero, to this uh, L0 norm. But it will not be a norm anymore. It will not satisfy all the, all the axioms of a norm. So this is so, sort of a pseudo-norm. 
And we can write this as the sum over these functions h, c, i, where h gives you 1 at, uh, at every non-zero value of, uh, of c, and 0 otherwise. Uh, 0, of course, at 0, right? So you are counting non-zero elements. Of course, this is a non-convex function. And if we plug in this prior, it will result in the, this lambda times L0 norm uh, prior term in the map estimation problem. So instead of L1, we are writing L0. And this is a very common, commonly used prior. Okay? Now, how do we solve this thing? Counting, so when, whenever you hear the word counting, it looks like an ugly combinatorial problem, right? And it appears that despite the fact that this H is, is a non-convex problem, you can actually find its proximal operator. It is given by this very simple expression. So if you take P uh, of lambda H, it will be what is called this uh, hard thresholding. So essentially, if C is, uh, the absolute value of C is bigger than the square root of twice lambda, you are going to return C, basically the identity map, and otherwise you are going to return 0. So basically, it looks like this. This is the function. Okay, so it's a typical, a typical th this is what you usually mean by, by saying thresholding, right? So this is called hard thresholding. Let's denote it by H. Let's denote it by H. And you can still, despite the fact that H is a non-convex function, you can still de do a, a proximal gradient iteration with the hard thresholding replacing the uh, soft thresholding that we had in ISTA. Okay, so basically replacing the L1 norm uh, with an L0 norm uh, just replaces this uh, element-wise nonlinearity. Okay, so this is the, non the element-wise nonlinearity, and this is the so-called soft thresholding, iterated soft thresholding, and iterated hard thresholding side by side. Okay, we have an L1 prior here, and the soft threshold in the proximal gradient iteration. We have the L0 prior here and the hard thresholding in the proximal gradient iteration. And again, the, both priors are very frequently used. So any questions on, on, uh, on what we have seen so far? So essentially, essentially we rephrased what we did until now uh, using the idea of uh, proximal operator and, uh, and proximal gradient. Okay. So let me try to uh, play a little bit with our priors. So our prior, we, remember we started with a, with a very simple prior that our patch in an image is, uh, is just one of the, of the collection of exemplars. Then we extended this to uh, sparse linear combinations of some, of some exemplars. Then we extended this to a translation equivariant construction. So this, this gave us a, a prior for the entire image. But let's go back to the patch setting and assume the following very simple prior, that our patch belongs to a k-dimensional linear subspace. So we have uh, some multi-dimensional space, and we just want to, uh, to span the content of the page with, with k, uh, k basis functions, basis vectors. Okay? So I will assume that my, my patch is given by, let's say, some, some mu. I will get rid of this mu in a second, plus a combination of k functions phi 1 until phi k. Okay? So I will write it again as mu plus phi c. Phi is my synthesis operator, c is the vector of coefficients. Okay, so this is the finite dimensional case. Let me now assume that c is Gaussian with sigma sig with, uh, with variance uh, sigma squared. Of course, if I take this variance to infinity, it will be just a uniform prior, right? So again, what gives me the intricate structure of the pitch are the phi's, not, not the c's. So I'm assuming something very simple on, on the c. Okay, so I plug this into my map estimator. My estimator of f, the content of the pitch, will be given by this synthesis. And what I really care about is f solving a minimization problem, a map 
estimation problem for the coefficients, right? Because my prior is on the coefficients. So I will write here lambda uh, in terms of sigma e squared over sigma squared. Sigma e was the was the um, was the amount of noise that we had in our forward model, if you remember. Okay, so basically this this was the scaling coefficient of of this uh, of this term. So I, I I get this problem. Okay, and I can of course give a closed form solution to it. Right, it would be it would be inverting phi adjoint phi, but now because of this prior, I also need to add lambda i. And we have seen this already when we talked about Wiener uh, filters, right? So this is a regularized inverse. I'm regularizing the inverse. When my data te term is, uh, my it might amplify noise. This regularization uh, suppresses the amplification of noise. And the bigger is lambda. Lambda is big when the amount of noise in my, uh, in my forward model is big, right? So the, the, the lower is the scenario, the bigger regularization I need in order to, uh, to solve this problem. So this is a closed form expression, but let's see what we, so I'm just plugging in this uh, optimal C here, and this is, this is the closed form expression I have my, for my estimator. But let's just see what we did. So we assumed uh, this Gaussian form of C, right? So then it will be, we, we are essentially assuming that the patch itself is Gaussian with some non-trivial covariance matrix phi adjoint phi, okay? But obviously it is quite quite ridiculous to, to assume that you can model a patch with a Gaussian distribution. Gaussian distributions are really, really simple. You cannot model anything useful with a Gaussian distribution, right? It's, it's a very simple distribution. It just looks like noise, maybe some colored noise, but Pitch has structure, right? And this doesn't have any structure. So basically, what I can I can say that, well, I can model a pitch with a Gaussian distribution, but th that has to be a very narrow class of pitches. So suppose I have some class of pitches like this. So each each of the nine examples here is a pitch. I can find parameters of the Gaussian distribution that describe this pitch. I can easily model this as some constant, some DC plus, some, some noise around it. Textures are well, well modeled by noise. But then another class, another collection of patches that look differently will necessarily need to have a different covariance matrix. And this different covariance matrix is embodied by a different set of uh, basis functions, psi, uh, sorry, phi, and basically a different synthesis operator. Of course, there is no reason to expect that I will have the same set of coefficients. Okay, so basically I can, I can model different collections of pitches as uh, something that belongs to a low-dimensional, still a k-dimensional uh, subspace, but for every narrow collection of pitches, it will be a different subspace. Okay, so if you can think of all pitches lying on some manifold, l let me try drawing this, this geometrically. So in my embedding space, my pitches lie on some very complicated manifold, okay? And what I'm doing, I'm selecting a region of that manifold and I'm approximating it by a linear space. Then another region by another linear space, low dimensional, k dimensional space, okay? Another, and another one, okay? So this is what I'm doing essentially, okay? So if you take a sufficiently small portion of the manifold, well, of course you can, uh, you can linearly approximate it. Think just of the tangent space of that manifold. It approximates well some region around, around your, basically the point that you decided uh, to, be, uh, to be the origin. So basically what I'm trying to say is that uh, my prior now, now tells me that my patch belongs to one of the set of k-dimensional subspaces. So I don't know which one, but basically all of them together form the very intricate and uh, highly nonlinear manifold to which, patch, to which all the patches belong. Okay, so I can translate this into a prior. I can say that there is some probability that I will call alpha k. I will have a total set of m such subspaces. With some probability alpha k, my page belongs to one of these linear subspaces. Okay, so basically given k, I have this simple prior for the page. That, the, that's the Gaussian prior that I had before, okay? 
So C given K is, uh, is this simple Gaussian distribution. Okay? And of course, if I now marginalize over K, I sum over K with the probabilities alpha K, I will get this thing, right? Of course, this density here will be the Gaussian density, right? This is the Gaussian density. So what I now end up with is that my uh, prior probability for the entire patch is the sum of Gaussian density, is a weighted sum of Gaussian uh, density, and this is called the Gaussian mix mixture model. So a, Gaussian, a, a simple Gaussian will not model anything useful, but a mixture of Gaussians will, will be actually a very good model. So again, going back to my manifold uh, visualization, so let's say this is my manifold, so I will put a Gaussian here, a Gaussian distribution here. It will be very, it will be very no narrow in those dimensions in which the manifold has no, uh, no thickness. And it will span its tangent space locally. And then I will put another Gaussian here, and another Gaussian here, okay? and another Gaussian here. And basically together they will, will produce a probability distribution that can be arbitrarily complicated. Okay? So the Gaussian mixture model is a, is a very powerful prior. But if you want now to use it in the map estimation problem, you end up with the log or the negative log of a sum of Gaussian densities. And unfortunately, the log, uh, the log of a sum is not separable anymore. You cannot split it as the log of the product. OK, so it's a mess. It's a, it's a highly non-convex function. It's, it's very difficult to work with. So let me revisit this mixture model from a, from a different perspective, from our perspective of, of sparsity. Okay, and I would like to lead you to what is called group sparsity or some kind of a structured sparsity. I would like to inject this kind of a mixture structure into our uh, simplistic sparsity model that we had so far. So I will assume again I'm I'm dropping this uh, DC term mu. I can absorb it into uh, one of the functions, obviously. So I will I will assume that I have a collection of m synthesis operators. Within each, so each synthesis operator encodes one of those subspaces that I described. Okay, I will use a different set of coefficients c1 to cm to encode the patch in each subspace, and I will allow, I will allow, the same way we did with with uh, with the, uh, with the exemplars, I will allow to sum the uh, the vectors from these, uh, basically from all these contributions. Of course. If you think of a manifold, geometrically it means, means no sense to sum points belonging to different, uh, to different tangent spaces. They, they, they cannot sum. This, even this function, this, this operation is not defined. It is, of course, defined in the, in the, in the embedding space because it's a Euclidean space. But, but it makes geometrically no sense. You're going to get a point typically outside of the manifold. Now, I will think of all these operations as a kind of a group dictionary and a group structured set of coefficients. So I'm, I'm splitting my coefficient vector, my big coefficient vector C, into m subvectors that I think of them as coefficients for each group. And I will assume the following prior. I will assume that within each group, my, my coefficients are Gaussian. Th that was my prior before. So within each group, each CK is a Gaussian vector. And I, will, I would like the norm, so if I take the norm of the vector within each group, I would ideally would like it to be either big or zero, right? I would like, I would like ideally just one group to be active at every time. But let's relax this and l let's say I would like a small number of groups to be active at every time. So I don't want to mix all these uh, dictionaries together. I would like to mix a small, a small number of dictionaries together. So this translates into sparsity prior on the norms of this, of the, of these subvectors. Okay, so the the amount of energy that below, that I have in each group has to be sparse. So I form a new vector. Think of it this way: I form a new vector, the norm of C1 until the norm of CK, sorry CM, and this vector has to be sparse. Okay. So by, by demanding sparsity of this vector, I essentially want only a few groups to be active every time. I don't know which groups. It depends on the page. Okay. So it basically, pay attention. I, I did exactly the same trick that I did with, with passing f from exemplars to 
uh, to sparsity, right? For, with exemplars, I wanted just one exemplar to be active every time. That's why the vector quantization model was was relevant, and I replaced it by uh, by by allowing a small number of exemplars to be active every time, and that gave us the regular element-wise sparsity model. Here, I'm instead of exemplars, I have mixtures. I have the Gaussian mixture model, and instead of demanding uh, individual coefficients to be sparse, I demand groups to be sparse. So I want basically a structured sparsity. I would like if I have some group active, then basically all the coefficients in that group will will be something, will be some dense vector, Gaussian, Gaussian distribution. But but otherwise, the group, all the elements of the group, has to be uh, have to be zero. Okay. So this is my prior. It is called group sparsity prior. So the coefficients are dense within the group and sparse among among the groups. Okay. So let's tr translate this into. Clear, clear mathematical statements. I'm assuming that each CK is Gaussian, and the normal uh, norms of each CK uh, follow this uh, double exponential distribution, so a super Gaussian distribution. Th th that was our way of saying sparse. Okay. So the map estimator translates into a minimization problem again uh, over the set of all coefficients. Now the, this vector of coefficients has a uh, sub-vector structure that represents the groups. So I have a certain number of dimensions that I called k within each group, and I have m such groups, so I have a, a km dimensional coefficient vector. I have this term, this L2 term, that without the red term, without this, this term here, just gave us a closed form solution, right? For the for the Gaussian for the Gaussian uh, for a single Gaussian model. And I have this new term that sums the... So you can think of it as an L1 on the vector of norms. So it will be a sum of the L2 norms within each group, and there is no square on the L, uh, on the L2 norms. So this lack of square is crucial. If we had square, that would be just the, the, the L2 norm of C. So this is, uh, this is kind, of, kind of a weird norm that is called group norm. Okay, so it's uh, it's the L one on the uh, on the m dimensional vector of sub vector norms. Okay, are you following? So we have two smooth terms. One of them is this L two regularization term. If I assume that if I allow very big variance of the coefficients within each group, I'm essentially going to make this constant. The lambda will be very small because it's inversely proportional to sigma squared, and then basically it will become a uniform prior, as expected, right? And what really matters is this uh, group norm that I have here. Now, the proximal operator of this group norm, it's a separable function, but it is not separable in coordinates. It is separable in groups of coordinates. Still, the tensor product rule works, right? So it will be the tensor product of these proximal operators that essentially do L2 norm on each of the groups, okay? One of the M groups that I have, okay? Just remind ourselves what was the uh, proximal operator of the L2 norm. It was this shrinking operator that I will now denote by R. It was shrinking the norm and keeping the same direction of the vector, okay? So here I, I basically did the ratio of the of the so basically, this 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 already takes care of the of the of the normalization. So I'm keeping the same the same vector and I'm shrinking it towards zero. Okay, if the norm is smaller than this value mu, it will become strictly zero. Otherwise, it will be shrunk <laughs> towards zero. But the direction will 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 remain the same. And I'm doing it for every group. Okay, so I'm essentially applying this for every group. I'm scaling the vector by this amount. So each group, if the group has a lot of energy, it will be shrunk toward the zero. If the group has a small amount of energy, it will become zero. So basically, I will be eliminating groups with a small, with small, with a little, with little energy within them, and that's why it promotes group sparse solutions. And sometimes in the literature, this is called G lasso or group lasso. So it's 
it's similar to our lasso problem, but instead of the L1 norm, we have we have the uh, the group norm. Okay. Now we can do another step. We can use actually an overcomplete dictionary. So we have a collection of M synthesis operators, right? Let's use overcomplete synthesis operators for each of the groups. And within uh, within this model, our coefficient in each group also have to be sparse. So I'm just taking my previous model that I'm doing sparse representation for each group, and I'm now taking a mixture of sparse models. And this is called hierarchical sparsity, because I have sparse coefficients within each group, and then I have a sparse collection of such groups. Okay, so this is called hierarchical sparsity. And of course, in terms of the optimization problem, I will have two terms. One term will be just the regular L1 norm. So th this will be the sum of the L1 norms coming from this prior. But the sum of the L1 norms is just the L1 norm of, it, of the entire C. And this will be the group norm, right? So I will just write it like this, okay? So we have, this is called high lasso or hierarchical lasso. We have element-wise sparsity promoted by the L1 term. And we have the group sparsity promoted by this second red term with the group norm, okay? Now, we know how the proximal operator of the L1 term looks like, right? That was the element-wise shrinkage. This, this tensor product is k times m-dimensional, right? And we have the group-wise shrinkage, which is an m-dimensional tensor product. Now, how do we combine them? What is the proximal operator of the sum of these two norms? And unfortunately, this is a very very unfortunate fact about proximal operators that in general there is no simple expression for the sum of the of, of two functions so if i know uh, proximal operator of h and the proximal operator of g i have no idea what will be the proximal operator of h plus g except some favorable cases and we have a favorable case we have what is called a nested group structure so basically the element you can think of it as a tree with two levels we have groups the vector is split into groups, non-overlapping groups, and each group is subsequently split into elements. Okay? So we have a tree-like structure. And in this case, the proximal operator of the sum... Pardon? Oh, sorry. Okay. So in this case, the, the proximal operator uh, of the sum becomes the composition of the proximal operator, the order is important. Uh, I I'm first doing the proximal operator of the lowest level in the hierarchy, the element-wise level, and then I'm doing the group-wise level. So this is there's some problem here. It's not the norm, of course. It's the C itself. Okay, please fix it. So I'm first doing element-wise shrinkage by the proximal operator of the L1. And then on whatever remains, I'm doing the group shrinkage by the proximal operator of the group norm, okay? And the order is important, of course. The, these operations are not commutative. And you can extend it to multiple levels of hierarchy, create tree-like hierarchies. This is sometimes used in signal processing, less so in image processing. But this is a m much more powerful, much uh, wider and uh, more representative family of priors. Uh, what is interesting that it is uh, general uh, that it generalizes the Gaussian mixture model. The Gaussian mi mixture models were very popular in image processing in the beginning of 2000 for for a few years. So I, I basically you can see that this family of priors can also be viewed from the point of view of sparsity. Okay. So high lasso, just to summarize, and group lasso is a particular case of high lasso with so G lasso is the particular case with lambda equals zero, of course, right? So you don't have this, uh, you don't have this uh, element-wise term. It is just a, gra uh, just a proximal gradient iteration that solves it. But now I have two proximal operators that I'm applying. I'm first doing element-wise shrinkage and then group-wise shrinkage. 
Okay, so let, let's now move to a to another class, a sort of a complementary class of priors that still uses sparsity. So let let's look at this image. Now this is arguably a na natural image, right? So if you take the great the derivatives in the x and the y direction, what do, what do you see? How can you characterize these signals? So you see so so you see a sparse image, right? Most of the most in most of the pixels, the derivative is very small. It is very, st or let me put it differently, there are, there is a small set of pixels where the gradient where the derivatives are are strong, and these are the edges of the image. Okay, and the, and images typically uh, have this form. They have a small set of uh, points where the gradient is very strong. Actually, the function is discontinuous. So you can not really, strictly speaking, t t talk about the gradient. But at least in the discrete case, you always can. And then there is a, a, basically all the, a, the rest of the points will have some, some uh, well-behaved uh, uh, values of the derivatives close to zero, because the texture is some kind of little noise. So if you take the gradient, you see basically these are the two components of the of this two-dimensional gradient and the gradient itself on the right hand side. Uh, this is a sparse signal. What is interesting is that the two components of the gradient, the x and y component, are not com not independent. So if I have strong gradient in this pixel, there will be a non-zero derivative here and probably a non-zero derivative here. And if I have zero gradient here, then these two components will be zero, obviously. Right? So there is some kind of group structure, sparsity. It is sparse in the x-y dimension, and the components of the vector are usually dense. Whenever, the, whenever I, I hit a point where, the, where I have the non-trivial support of the, of the gradient, then basically all the components will typically be non-zero. Okay? So we can model this by the following, by the following model. I will define the gradient operator. It will take a scalar valued function on R D and it will map it into a vector valued D dimensional vector valued function on R D itself. So I'm writing this as L squared R D R D. Okay, so this is the space of uh, square integrable D dimensional functions. Okay? So the gradient of course maps a function to the uh, D dimensional vector composed of its um, uh, direction derivatives with the directions of the standard basis vectors. Okay, and my prior is that the norm of this gradient vector, the L2 norm of this gradient vector at every point x, is following the uh, our regular uh, super Gaussian distribution. So again, I am assuming sparsity over x over the location parameter. So most of the time, this vector will have a small norm, but then the, the way the coefficients are distributed within, I don't care. I have no prior on that. Let's say it's a uniform prior or a Gaussian prior. But most of the time, the value of the norm will be small. Occasionally, it will be large. So this is, this is exactly my model for this uh, behavior of the gradient, that it is most of the time close to zero. So it has a very big peak at zero. If we, if we draw, draw a histogram of this gradient, it will look like a very a heavy tailed and highly peaked distribution. This is exactly our model for sparsity. And we are pragmatically selecting this double sided exponential because it leads to a convex, a convex prior. Okay, so it is sparse as a function of x, and it is not sparse, uh, basically, the. the the, the coefficients themselves, the components of the vector itself, are uh, dense at those points where the norm is big. Okay. So again, if we assume our simple uh, forward model, just a reminder, I'm assuming that my image is contaminated by additive white Gaussian noise with, uh, with uh, variance sigma e squared. This is my regular log, log, uh, negative log likelihood, right? This was my data fitting term, just the L2 norm. This is my uh, uh, negative log prior. Now the prior is our regular sparsity prior or group sparsity prior with now the gradient vector going into the group norm. Okay, so this is just a continuous formulation of the group norm. I'm summing over x 
the L2 norms of the gradient vector. Okay, and this is how the posterior is going to look like. This is the function that we are going to minimize in our map estimation problem, right? So this is how we estimate f given the observation y. Okay, so we can think of what is written here as a kind of a new norm of a function f, and it, this norm is called the total variation norm. So we are measuring the integral of the of the norm of the gradient of a function. This this quantity is called total variation. Okay, so basically we have the regular L two norm squared coming from the uh, from the likelihood term plus lambda times the the total variation of the function. Okay, this TV norm is exactly that integral of the norm of the gradient, and of course this lambda. You can think of, it, of this as a regularization parameter. It grows as the SNR in our forward model drops. So the, the lower is the SNR, the more regularization we need. Okay. Now let's generalize this model. So we still don't know how to solve it. And there, uh, I am already warning you, there will be a problem. Okay. It will not have a closed form uh, proximal operator anymore because of this because of this gradient popping up in the norm. Okay, but let's let's ignore this little numerical problem for a, for a second. So let's generalize this model first. I would like to generalize it to what is called the analysis sparse or cosparse model. Essentially, what we had in the TV norm, we had an analysis operator. I'm I will denote the analysis operator with with this adjoint sign like we did when we talked about uh, frames, uh, analysis and synthesis operators. So we use synthesis operators so far. Let's use an analysis operator for a patch. The analysis operator will take a patch, the content of a patch. Okay, this is an L, L square function on this d-dimensional cube domain that we defined. This is our patch. And it will give me a k-dimensional vector of coefficients. Okay, this is our analysis operator. So essentially what it will do, it will take uh, my patch f and it will project it in onto a set of k functions psi 1 to psi k. Of course, the projections are defined using the, the regular inner product on that patch domain. Okay, so this is my analysis operator. And my prior on the patch will be by saying that the projection of my patch by this analysis operator is sparse. Okay, so I'm projecting my, my I'm projecting my patch onto a set of functions, and most of the projection coefficients should be zero or close to zero, or at least they should follow this double exponential distribution. Okay, so this is my patch prior. Okay, so basically, the case of the total variation was, well, let, let, let me let me show you. The, the, the total variation will be a particular case of a slightly more general form of this because total variation was applied to the entire image. Here we are still dealing with, with a single patch. So basically, let's write the, the negative log, uh, uh, log density of this prior. It will be just uh, proportional to the L1 norm of the analysis operator applied to, to, to the patch. Okay? Let's now move the same way we did with synthesis. We moved from synthesis of a patch to synthesis of the entire image by demanding translation equivariance. Let's take the analysis operator and make it translation equivariant. Okay? So basically, the analysis operator will produce a set of coefficients, k-dimensional vector of coefficients, as a function of the location parameter. Okay? So here now we have a location parameter. Okay? And it will be translation equivalent, so it, I will be doing convolutions of f with the functions psi 1 to psi k. So this will be usually locally supported functions. I'm doing convolutions with these functions. Of course, convolution is, you know, it is equivalent to inner product up to some mirroring of the, of the, uh, of the argument. Okay, so my prior will be now that for every location x, this, set, this, this vector valued function has to obey the the uh, the double exponential distribution. It has to be sparse, okay. And this is what my uh, negative log density will look like. It will be the integral of this 
one norm here. I can actually do a variant with a group norm. <coughs> with, so this is the variant of the group norm. I will assume that that the norm of my projection is sparse, but not the elements themselves. And basically, if I use this variant, the total variation will be a particular case, right? The analysis operator corresponding to the total variation will be just this operator that maps f to its uh, partial derivatives. Now, I, I'm writing convolution of each of these d1 to, d, to dd with f, so it's not exactly a function, right? It's, it's a distribution, the derivative. The, I, need a, I need basically a delta uh, to, to get a derivative, right? I need something that is not a function. But anyway, it is, it is, uh, it is uh, a particular case of this analysis uh, sparse model. Okay? Now, this norm, basically what I'm doing here, the sum of the L2 norms, we had it in group sparsity. It is typically called the L21 norm. So just imagine that I'm first doing the L2 norm uh, of groups, and then I'm doing the L1 norms of the L2 norms. So that's why it is called the L21 norm. So you can think of a matrix. I'm first computing the L2 norm of rows, and then I'm computing the L1 norms of the resulting vector. OK? Now, in sparse synthesis, just let's compare the two models. In sparse synthesis, I had this estimation problem. I estimated the coefficients and then synthesized them using my synthesis operator phi. Okay? And the coefficients, uh, for solving for the coefficients, I had the prior that appeared as, uh, as the L1 norm of the coefficient vector c. And I had the synthesis model here, so it was phi c in the data term. Okay, and of course I could add some fancier expressions to to complicate my prior using uh, group sparsity, hierarchical sparsity, basically according to your to your flavor. And we had this proximal gradient, right? So we had the proximal operator of these red terms that was applied to the gradient step on the smooth term on the L two term. Okay, so this was sparse synthesis worked really well. It's a convex problem, converges fast. The proximal operator was, of course, in closed form, for at least for the priors that we have seen. Now, in sparse analysis, we have we are working, we are estimating directly f, directly the image itself. That's why the data term, this part, is very simple. It has no phi or psi here. On the other hand, in the prior, we have the analysis operator, right? Because the the analysis because we we modeled our prior as the sparsity of the coefficients that the analysis operator produces from f, okay? Like the gradient is sparse, not the f, not f itself, but the gradient of f is sparse. So that's why the analysis operator appears in the prior term. And of course we had variants like the total variation. We can add group structure instead of the L1 norm. We can have the L2 one norm the group norm is essentially but again the analysis operator stays in the prior term right and this is a problem because once we have some matrix here some non-orthogonal matrix here there is no more closed form for the proximal operator so before we had we had a very simple form of the proximal gradient algorithm here we don't have any closed form for the proximal gradient algorithm and computing these uh, com computing the the proximal operator by actually solving an optimization problem we could do it but it would be extremely inefficient so here we just did element wise shrinkage or group wise shrinkage in the second case in this case of sparse analysis we cannot do it anymore okay okay so i will I will show you to, to you just this, and then we'll finish the the, the remainder in in the, in the in the next lecture. So the 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 source of the problem was this: the presence of the analysis operator in the L1 norm, or in any non-smooth norm of which we would like to to compute the proximal operator. And what I'm proposing, or it's, it's not me; it's basically the wealth of literature that did it before. <coughs> Basically, it's to 
to perform variable splitting. So this variable splitting is known in optimization theory as Douglas Rashford splitting, and it was reinvented as w w under the name of Bregman splitting, uh, and uh, this name persisted in in uh, quite a, quite a lot of papers. But then they discovered that they found what was already done a uh, few decades before. So basically, I'm going to rename this psi adjoint f and will give it uh, a new variable z. Okay? And then I will write the following optimization problem. I will optimize over f and over z simultaneously. The first term will depend on f, the second term will depend on z. Okay? Of course, if I don't couple the, these two variables, I will get nonsense. So I need to couple these variables, so I'm adding a constraint. This constraint tells me that z is exactly psi adjoint f. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Okay? So it looks like a kind of a tautology, right? So I, I added another optimization variable, but it is linked by this constraint. Okay? But you will see, I will, we'll, we'll do it next week, you will see that by doing this splitting, you can actually do steps on this term and on this term, you see now there is nothing, no no operator acting on on, the, on z under the L1 norm. So it has a closed form proximal operator. We'll need to deal with the constraints. So what I will what I will show you, I will show you briefly a method that is called augmented Lagrangian for solving any constraint problem. And when you plug uh, plug Douglas Rashford splitting into augmented Lagrangian, it leads to an algorithm that is called ADMM, uh, um, alternating. Uh, alternating direction method of multipliers, which is augmented Lagrangian with this kind of splitting. It can be interpreted as, as, a, as, a, as, a, as an algorithm that does primal step on, on the first term and dual step on another term. Again, there are many, many fancy words that you can, you can tell about, about it from uh, the optimization perspective, but basically we will just care about this algorithm because it allows us to use uh, closed form expressions for the proximal operator. Okay, so we'll see, we'll see this next week, how to practically, how to numerically solve these kind of, uh, these kind of models, these kind of estimation problems with analysis models. So it was first introduced for total variation under the name of Bregman splitting and also under the name of ADMM. Uh, and then of course it was extended to this more general analysis model. So once we, we do this, next week I will also show you, uh, we still haven't answered the question, where does the dictionary come from? So we assume that we have some, some analysis or synthesis dictionary that gives us a good prior, but where does it come from? So we'll show you that we can actually learn these dictionaries from the data. So we'll, we'll see algorithms for doing dictionary learning, and then we'll see the connection between learning dictionaries to learning actually the entire pursuit process. So basically this iterative algorithm that, you're, that you see here, you can think of it as some sequence of nonlinear transformations of, uh, of your input, of your observation Y. And if you go in this direction, you can actually learn, the, uh, learn this sequence of transformation. It will, it will give a, a parametric family of learnable models with very particular type of operations, it will look like a set of convolutions, followed by the nonlinearity coming from the proximal operator. And this proximal operator gives a nonlinearity, remember, at least in a simple form, that looks like ReLDU. So what we will end up with will be a CNN, a convolutional neural network. And it has very interesting relations to sparsity that I will show you next week. So I would like to, to proceed from the point where we stopped last, uh, last time. Um, so for, uh, let, let me let me tell you a little bit what what I'm planning for uh, for the next uh, three weeks that are remaining in in this class. So first of all, today I would like to finish that part regarding the little numerical problem that we had uh, with uh, with analysis models that we didn't have a closed form for the proximal operator, and I will show you a family of methods that was developed exactly for these kind of problems, and th this is a very powerful. Uh, set of tools that you can use for many problems, not only in signal processing, but, but in general. And then, then I will show you, uh, maybe this is a question that you asked yourselves, but 
never had the courage to uh, to ask it uh, loud, ask it aloud. Basically, where do dictionaries come from? So, so basically, I will show you how to learn dictionaries, and from uh, from learning dictionaries, you will uh, and uh, and in introducing a, a little bit more advanced uh, a model for uh, sparsity. We'll see the connection to uh, to convolutional neural networks and to autoencoders in general. Then. Then today, what uh, today what I plan for for today? Remember, I told you that if you have a good denoiser, then it can uh, act as a prior in uh, in other problems. I will uh, I will bring uh, uh, Mickey Avad, who is one of the one of the founders and one of the one of the biggest figures in in this field that I'm showing to you today for for one hour to give a guest lecture exactly about denoisers as priors. Uh, uh, it will be fun. And, uh, and next week I will show you that once we are already trained to uh, look at everything as an inverse problem, let's revisit what we did in the beginning. We talked about sampling, so I would like to address sampling as an inverse problem and show you some more uh, advanced ways of doing sampling, including compressed sensing, and then I will show you some, uh, some fun stuff, how actually this can be translated into hardware, into optics and into electronics, and basically how to build completely crazy cameras. For example, a camera that has just one pixel and something that modulates light and different, uh, different optical and electronic designs. Uh, and then uh, we'll have time for you to to present uh, basically your project ideas, and we'll, we can discuss that in class. Okay, so this is this is the this is uh, the schedule for the remainder of the class. So let's get get back to our stuff um, on the analysis priors. I remind you that we we have seen two kinds of priors. One of them was uh, representing our signal of interest using the uh, synthesis operator phi. Okay, so basically we are looking for a set of coefficients C that admits uh, some kind of structured prior, and we have seen sparsity, element-wise sparsity, and group sparsity, and hierarchical types of sparsity. So we have uh, we have gone really wild uh, uh, there, and you are actually doing what is called pursuit. So basically we are looking for a set of coefficients that represents in this structured way. Uh, the signal of interest, and then the signal of interest is uh, is, esti is estimated by by doing uh, synthesis with that set of coefficients that is found as an optimization problem. And this was a non-smooth optimization problem because of these uh, L1 or uh, group norms that are are non-differentiable. And we have seen a family of optimization algorithms that we called proximal gradient. It's a generalization of uh, projected gradient descent that was very efficient if we had a closed form for the proximal operator. And we have seen that the L1 norm and the group norm and their combinations actually uh, yield uh, simple closed form expressions for the proximal operator. In the sparse analysis case, instead of working with the representation coefficients, we are estimating the signal directly. Again, as a minimization problem, we have a likelihood term, as always, here. And then we have a prior term. And the prior term tells us that a sparse projection on some analysis dictionary, I mean, the, uh, the projection of the estimated signal on, on uh, an analysis dictionary, which I'm denoting by psi adjoint, is sparse, okay? And we, we got the motivation for this model from uh, the total variation model, but again, this can be extended to uh, more general dictionaries. And the problem, once we have something non-orthogonal popping up in this uh, L1 norm or L21 norm, is that there is no more closed form for the proximal operator. Okay? So this is a problem. So we don't really have an efficient algorithm yet for solving these kind of uh, pursuit problems. Okay? And I will show you a way how to, uh, with a slightly more complicated algorithm, essentially do uh, proximal, uh, proximal descent steps. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to, again, I'm interested in this problem, and this problem has this complication here. So let's, uh, let's do what is called uh, variable splitting. It usually goes under the name of Douglas Rashford, but sometimes in some other uh, subset of literature it goes under the name of Bregman splitting. So I'm going to introduce a new variable, z. So I, I want this to be 
just to appear the, the, the norm of z, the norm of some variable. So if I write it this way, of course I can apply the closed form expression for uh, the proximal operator. So let's call this expression z, and then I will solve an optimization problem with respect to two variables, okay? f and z. So f will appear in the first term, z will appear in the second term, everything is good, but for, in order for this to work, of course, I need to couple z and f. So I end up with a constrained optimization problem, okay? Now, how do we solve generally constrained optimization problems? And again, we, we have a, a particular form that has two objectives, or basically an aggregate of two objectives, this, this L2 squared term and this L1 term, or maybe some other more complicated uh, non-smooth term. But let's, uh, let's assume we, we have in general a, a problem w w having a, some objective, which can be non-smooth, and a constraint. Let's assume in our case we have a linear equality constraint. So we have Z related to F by a linear operator A. Okay? And we have two, two variables, of course, F and Z. So what we can do, we can, we can add, so we, we transform this constrained optimization problem into an unconstrained optimization problem. Instead of, instead of demanding that the constraints are satisfied exactly, we will penalize for the violation of the constraints. So one of the standard ways to penalize for the violation of the constraint is just to put a quadratic penalty. So the quadratic penalty will grow fast to infinity if the constraints are violated. So we want every constraint to be, uh, to be approximately zero in order for this penalty term to be small. A question? Okay, so the, the, the question was, what, why not we introduce uh, Lagrange multipliers? This is coming in the next slide. Okay. okay. So, so, uh, uh, so, so basically, so bear with me, this is just a trivial way, right? I'm adding this, I'm adding this term. And I'm solving a different problem, an unconstrained problem. We know how to solve unconstrained problems, right? I would just run proximal, uh, proximal descent on this problem. Now the proximal operator of HZ is, is closed form. If, if H has a good, uh, uh, some good expression like the L1 norm. What I'm going to get, I'm going to get uh, a solution of this problem. It will be basically two variables, F and Z. I will call it F star rho and Z star rho. It depends on the parameter rho of course. And what I wanted instead is the solution F star and Z star of the original constraint problem. Now, what is the relation of these two solutions? Obviously, when you take rho to infinity, this solution will converge to the one that we actually want to obtain. Okay? But unfortunately, taking rho to infinity is not exactly easy numerically. It will introduce huge gradients in the optimization, and in general, it is not a good idea to, to work with something that goes to infinity. Okay, so it, it is numerically quite difficult to work with, with these uh, penalty methods. So what we can do instead, so basically what we did, uh, I, let, let me just rephrase it in a different term, we constructed what is called a penalty aggregate. This is called a penalty aggregate. It comprised the original objective and we added to it a penalty representing the constraints, okay? And instead of solving the constraint problem, we minimize this penalty aggregate uh, as an unconstrained problem, okay? And the minimizers of, of this unconstrained problem and the, the original constraint problem, they coincided when this parameter rho went to infinity. Now, I would like to augment this penalty aggregate with another term, a linear term, with a variable that I call alpha here in green, and this, this is called the augmented Lagrangian. So you can think of this augmented Lagrangian as the Lagrangian of the penalty aggregate in the constrained problem subject to the same set of uh, linear constraint. Of course, this alpha acts as the vector of Lagrange multipliers corresponding to the, to the, to the set of constraints that we have, and the advantage of uh, working with the augmented Lagrangian other than the, uh, with penalty aggregate is that the minimizer of this new objective of this new function, so we are doing unconstrained minimization of this, of this new function L, uh, if you update the multipliers, um, the minimizers will actually coincide for any choice of row. So any positive row will converge eventually to the solution of the of the uh, constrained minimization problem. Of course, the convergence speed might depend on the specific choice of rho, but you don't need to 
uh, make Rho very, very big in order for this, uh, for this method to work. Again, I don't have time, it, and it, it's out of, the, out of the scope of this course, but there are many profound reasons why, why this happens. Okay? But in general, this is a much better idea, much more stable and uh, faster algorithm to, uh, to solve any constraint problem. So basically, you can use this framework, this kind of a blueprint for any, uh, for any constraint minimization problems, specific, specifically when we combine the, this idea of augmented Lagrangian with uh, variable splitting, we end up with what is called ADMM, or alternating direction method of multipliers. Essentially, we took our objective composed of two functions with two split variables. We have f and z, remember? This is f and z, our two variables. We constructed the augmented Lagrangian, this function L, with a quadratic penalty and this linear term depending on the Lagrangian multipliers alpha that we're estimating. And now we can, we can do the following, uh, the following uh, iterative algorithm. We start with some in initialization of f. So I'm writing the iteration index in, uh, in uh, uh, superscript. So if I have f0, z0 will be initialized simply as a transforming f0. And I will start with the vector of ones representing the Lagrange multipliers, and essentially the method transforms into the, into the, uh, into the regular penalty method for the first iteration, of course. And then until convergence, I'm going to alternate the following three steps. First of all, I'm going to do a minimization step on f, fixing z and fixing alpha. So I'm, I'm just minimizing the augmented Lagrangian uh, with respect to f. Then I, I obtain the arg minimum, or I can actually do here an approximate arg minimum. I can do a few steps of some iterative algorithm. We'll see actually that we'll have a closed form expression here for our specific problem. So I found this optimal f that I, I, I call fk plus one. Then I'm going to minimize the augmented Lagrangian with respect to z, fixing the rest. Now, but now I have a new f, so I'm going to plug it in here, okay? And then what remains is to update the multipliers. So I have f and z. I'm going to plug them here and here. And now I'm updating alpha. I'm updating the multipliers. And then I iterate until I converge. Okay? So basically, this third expression is actually the formula that you, uh, that you need to, uh, to apply to update the multipliers. These are the approximate Lagrange multipliers with a quadratic penalty. And these entire things converge. Okay? Any questions? So let's see what happens in our case. So in our case, we have this particular form of G. This, this was the G term, and this was the H term, right? And our linear operator relating, relating the... Uh, it should be yeah. This the 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 term relating the uh, f with z was uh, the analysis operator, right? So let's just substitute everything into the three ADMM steps. Write it explicitly. I'm dropping terms that do not depend. So the terms that do not depend on f. For example, this h term in the first step, in the f step, we can think of it as a primal step. The second step, we can think of it as a dual step if you, if you, uh, if you basically uh, investigate what actually happens inside the algorithm. So there is no non-smooth term in the f step. Uh, also, the z step doesn't have, the, uh, doesn't have the first quadratic term because it doesn't depend on z. And then we have a closed form expression for the update of the multipliers. So let's look at the f step. So the f step, look, we have a quadratic term in f, another quadratic term in f, and a linear term in f, okay? So again, remember, z and alpha are constant. So we can write it in closed form, okay? So it's like just doing, a, just doing a, this regularized inverse applied to the data corrected by these, by these Lagrangian multiplier uh, vector transformed by, by by the joint of the analysis operator. So we have a closed form update for the um, for the f step. In the z step, 
we have essentially this quadratic term in Z plus a L1 term in Z. So again, it's split nicely in something quadratic and something non-smooth. We can do uh, this optimization. It doesn't have a closed form, but it has a simple, a simple proximal gradient iteration. Now, there is nothing that prevents us from doing an efficient proximal gradient iteration because there is no more uh, no operators here in the L1 norm. Okay? That's why we did variable splitting in the first place. Okay? So we do a few iterations of proximal gradient here and we update Z. And then we update the multipliers. Okay? So this is, this is the ADMM framework for sparse analysis. This is how, for example, total variation um, uh, model pursuit is, uh, is, is performed in basically any analysis pursuit is typically done with, with ADMM, with this algorithm. Any questions? Okay, let's look at a technical thing that we have here. So just remember, we have, for example, this expression here, right? This is the adjoint of the analysis operator. So we have the analysis operator and we need, we need its adjoint. Let's see how, uh, what will be the form of our adjoint operator. Okay, so our analysis operator took a square integrable function of d variables, of d arguments, of a d-dimensional vector argument, and gave us a k-dimensional function, again, function of a d-dimensional argument. Okay, so basically these were our projections on k, uh, on k functions. And the way we implemented it was by doing convolution. We wanted translation equivariance, so we just convolved our input signal f with these functions, psi 1 to psi k. Okay? And basically this is how we obtained uh, translation equivariant inner products with this basis function. Okay? Now the adjoint operator will of course take take this k-dimensional uh, vector valued function and map it again to a scalar valued function. Of course functions on RD in both cases. So this is our adjoint operator. Let's just formally obtain uh, the expression for the adjoint. Now I'm starting with this C, this is a vector, k-dimensional vector valued function. So it has the component C1 to CK. Each of them is an, is an L, L squared function on RD. And let's compute the inner product again on the space of uh, vector valued functions between psi adjoint F, it's not psi adjoint, we call it an analysis operator. It, uh, uh, in our notation it already uh, it was already denoted with the adjoint because what, what we will see in a second that the adjoint of this analysis operator is a synthesis operator. Okay, and it has exactly the same form that we had for, for the synthesis operator. So I'm starting with analysis operator acting on F in our product with C, right? This is the way we find the joints. So let's write this in our product explicitly. It is the sum over the that were over the components of these vector valued functions, some of the inner products of each of the component. So we have, so each compo uh, the component of this function has this form, right? It has this form. I'm taking it from here. Okay? And of course the component of the function C is just CK. So I'm summing their inner products over K. This is what we have. Now, remember that we can write this inner product of psi convolved with f and c. Psi is a linear operator. We can push it to the second argument of the inner product. What is the adjoint of convolution? It's convolution with this mirrored function psi bar. Right? So psi bar x is psi of minus x. Right? We did it already. I even showed you how this works in the case of uh, matrices. Convolution is a toplex matrix, a joint is transpose. If I transpose the toplex matrix, it will just mirror the, uh, the impulse response, right? So this is exactly the mirror of the impulse response. So let me substitute this result here. So I don't have psi acting on f anymore. I have psi bar acting on the c case, okay? And now let's move the sum inside. 
So I have an inner product on the space of scalar valued functions. This is what, of course, I was uh, striving to achieve. I have an inner product with f and some operator acting on c. Okay? But this operator has exactly the domain and the codomain of the adjoint that I'm looking for. So basically, this is exactly the adjoint, the adjoint of my analysis operator. So analysis operator was already denoted within the joint, so I will call this adjoint as psi. So the form of this adjoint operator psi is the sum of these mirrored functions psi bar. I'm convolving them with the CK and, sum, and I'm summing the results. Okay? So this is exactly how our synthesis operator looked like. Okay? So essentially, synthesis operators and analysis operators are one the joint of the other. In some literature, at least in deep learning literature, this is, this is called tensor convolution. So basically, we have, uh, we have think of an image as a, as a matrix, and now we have a matrix with several channels. So we have a three-dimensional matrix. It, is, it can be thought as, uh, as an object that is called a tensor, and we are convolving in, with respect to the first two dimensions, and then we are summing with respect to the third dimension. So this is called, this is called uh, tensor convolution operation. This is how our adjoint operator looks like. Now, unless there are any questions, let's move to the more interesting part of the question is basically, where do these functions come from? Where do we take phi and psi, and psi basically, or our analysis and syn synthesis models that we assumed given in, uh, in our models so far? Uh, 